Good morning, it's 259. Hope you're doing well. Uh, thanks for bearing with me. Today's Thursday morning, October the 1st. I, as I said, feeling a little under the weather yesterday, so feeling better today. Uh, so today's a short video lecture, uh, rather, of course, on our Zoom for this week. Uh, next week, we'll have a normal week, meet on Monday, uh, and then we'll do an, a discussion board assignment on Wednesday. Uh, for this week's discussion board, I'll post it today, which is, again, Thursday, October the 1st. Uh, but I will give you throughout the weekend to finish it just because it's supposed to get a day late. So you have it until Sunday. Uh, so the purpose of today's talk, which will be about 30 minutes or so, just to sort of set up what uh, we'll talk about next week, uh, is to talk just a little bit about uh, the period of the late 1760s and the 1770s uh, leading up to what will be the main theme of next week's class, which is the De Declaration of Independence. And a note on readings, uh, I asked us to read, as you know, uh, por part portions of Common Sense Sections 1 and 3. Um, first of all, just two things. You can find that on, you can find a link to it on Blackboard under Course Materials. You can purchase uh, a very inexpensive copy of it if you want. Uh, I'm assigning it by sections, and it's four sections altogether, because there are a lot of different versions that have a lot of different uh, page numbers. So it's easy it's just to say read sections one and three uh, this week and read sections four next week. And as you'll see, it's a relatively short pamphlet, and I'll talk mostly about it next week. Uh, I wanted to get you reading it because um, this week because uh, I want to set us up for the Declaration of Independence next week. But I do today want to talk a little bit about the Declaration of the Necessity of Taking Up Arms. Uh, and that link is now fixed on Blackboard, by the way. Uh, it broke, uh, the link broke, so I had to flip it out. Um, so you should be able to pull that up on Blackboard uh, as you watch this uh, this video. Okay, so um, up until this point, we've talked primarily about uh, the beginning of protests, uh, eventually, uh, uh, especially after the year 1763 uh, beginning to, to rise. And we talked about the proclamation line. We talked about a little bit about the Sugar Act and the Stamp Act. Sort of left off talking about the Stamp Act last class. So what I want to do for today is sort of set the scene, if you will. Uh, between 1765, the passage of the Stamp Act, and 1775, uh, the uh, last full year before uh, the... Uh, Declaration of Independence in 1775, also the very first actual fighting uh, militarily between uh, the North American colonists and Great Britain. And and rather than go chronologically through the litany of acts, beginning with the Sugar Act and the Stamp Act, uh, and then the colonial reactions to it, sort of speak a little bit thematically about it. Uh, so I want to talk primarily about two different themes today. Uh, one is the, uh, the sort of kinds, the types of protests that began to emerge after 1765 in particular. Uh, and the second is loyalism. Uh, so we'll talk about protests and we'll talk about loyalism. And the reason I want to talk about these two themes is because I think they'll give us a better sort of under, a more rounded understanding of what in fact was happening uh, in the decade before. Uh, the eventual Declaration of Independence. The reason I also paired these two together, the, the, again, the types of protests that we see emerge uh, and the theme of loyalism, moreover, uh, is that it'll help us understand, I think, uh, or give us tools, that's the better way to put it, it'll give us tools to not think about the Declaration of Independence, not think about the creation of an independent United States as if it were inevitable as if it were uh, always going to happen. It was just a question of when, uh, because that's the biggest trap that one can fall into uh, in, in covering this topic. Uh, and it's one, actually, that continues to have relevance uh, today, uh, political relevance. We can talk more about that uh, in the next few weeks. But if you view the American Revolution as not being inevitable, but being contingent, which means that uh, the eventual Declaration of Independence and the creation of an independent United States was uh, a process that might have went different ways, might have taken different paths, 
uh, and that there were contingent events that changed the course of history rather than being a foreordained inevitability. Sorry, from my profit. That I think is the best way to think about uh, this decade, decade from 1765 to 1775. Excuse me. Do need my coffee though. Okay, so let's start with protests, types of protesting. And, and again, I think this is more useful for, especially for a video, video lecture than, than going year by year. Um, if you've taken history one of the three with me, definitely, but if you've taken it at all, or taken the first half of American history until the Civil War survey elsewhere, probably going to be a little bit familiar with what I'm going to say. Uh, and you'll also probably be familiar with some of the acts and taxes that uh, people like me usually talk about when we talk about the decade between 1765 and 1775. But let's begin with the Stamp Act in 1765, which uh, is important in the context in which I'm speaking of it because it, it, it led to an explosion of colonial protests, which tended to take three different forms three different forms that were overlapping uh, and not mutually exclusive, but three different forms nonetheless. Uh, so just a little bit of background, and I, I won't talk about this for very long at all, but the Stamp Act was an act passed by Parliament in 1765, uh, in which uh, a, an internal tax, the tax internal inside, uh, tra transactions that happened within the North American colonies rather than an external tax on trade. Uh, a tax on paper goods, which uh, was, once it was discovered, once it was uh, news of the Stamp Act made, it, made its way to North America, uh, was almost immediately protested. Uh, and the protest took three different forms. Uh, the first is uh, what we can call official petitions, like as a, an official document created by colonial legislatures, uh, also one created by a so-called Stamp Act Congress, a meeting of nine of the 13 colonies in New York City uh, to create an official petition. These are the legal reasons why uh, we protest the Stamp Act. Uh, these are very dry documents. They're very formal. Uh, they're legislative documents. So they kind of reflect the, the elite white male view uh, of, or we can leave my criticism of the Stamp Act. And um, I didn't assign this one to read, but they're all very, they're, they're very similar. Uh, if you read the different petitions from individual colonies uh, or the Stamp Act Congress's petition, they, they tend to be very, very similar. And the main argument that they offer is the argument about uh, concerning representation. They don't use the phrase no taxation without representation because nobody really used that phrase actually in the 1760s, 1770s. That's a sort of later creation by subsequent generations. Well, what they did argue though is that the Stamp Act and future acts that would be passed uh, were illegitimate because the colonists did not get to elect one of their own to travel to the mother country to parliament and serve uh, as a member of parliament. So the, it's not ta no taxation without representation as much as it is, is the colonists do not have what they call actual representation. Meaning, uh, again, uh, the colonists in New York did not get to select a New York colonist to travel to England to serve in the parliament. It, just to be clear, uh, that was that had always been the case, uh, going all the way back to the earliest foundations of British colonies in the Americas. No colony ever got to elect members of parliament. Members of parliament always came from the mother country. That, that had always been true, that had never changed. It's only in the 1760s that the colonists begin to have a problem with this. I take from that what you will. Some would say that it's ironic. The second kind of protest that we see emerge, aside from these official petitions that tended to, dis to, to frame their arguments in terms of representation, uh, is called popular protest, and this is the much, much, much more exciting kind of protest. Uh, this is uh, on the ground, uh, often sometimes violent uh, resistance to 
British policies. So in this case, 1765, the Stamp Act. And this could take a bunch of different forms. Um, the most famous form is also the least common, which is called tarring and feathering. Maybe you've heard of that, in which British officials uh, were covered in hot tar and then feathers were put on the tar uh, is a form of torture, really. Uh, that wasn't very common. More common uh, was this uh, threat. Uh, so in the context of the Stamp Act, I'll just give you a couple of examples. Uh, the first important point to note is that uh, as soon as the Stamp Act was uh, made public and the colonists found out about it, uh, first in Boston, and this would later spread throughout North America, uh, men organized, men who were angry, by, uh, uh, angered at the Stamp Act, organized groups that they called the Sons of Liberty. Sons, S-O-N-S, like my son. Uh, the Sons of Liberty. Uh, these were protest groups, again, founded first in Boston and then later individually throughout towns, throughout the colonies of North America. These were local groups. Uh, there was no national or continental group. They were just local groups who organized themselves into resistance bands. They kind of tended to be the, the sort of middle class people. So uh, respectable, but not elite. Um, they were primarily responsible for sort of local resistance to the British Empire. Um, and usually threats worked. So what they would often do is just simply threaten, for example, the stamp tax collector in a city like Boston and prevent them from, from doing the job, basically. And the most famous case of this, just to give you an example, is somebody named John Malcolm, who was the stamp tax collector, British official in charge of collecting the stamp tax uh, in Massachusetts. Uh, who was uh, uh, threatened by the Boston Sons of Liberty. His house was destroyed and his uh, possessions were destroyed, his furniture. He was actually, eventually he was tarred and feathered, but that's only after he was threatened and harassed. Uh, he eventually went back to England uh, and where he actually he had a meeting with King George III in Parliament where he described uh, all of the horrible things that had happened to him. Uh, often the Sons of Liberty would just leave notes on people's doors to create a general atmosphere of fear around uh, collecting the stamp tax. Uh, interesting to note, and this sort of bleeds into the third kind of protest, uh, is uh, that women uh, sort of organized parallel organizations to the Sons of Liberty that, you guessed it, they call the Daughters of Liberty. Uh, so while the Sons of Liberty was a male organization, or, or male organizations, women uh, organized the Daughters of Liberty. The Daughters of Liberty uh, and others were primarily active in a third kind of protest. So just to sum up, the first kind is official petitions, the second kind uh, popular protests, the third kind is uh, economic resistance, using economic tools in order to promote a political goal. Um, and if you're, some of these might sound familiar to you in part because these, these kind of protests, these two, so it's three types, uh, you know, continue to exist now. And, and of course, we live in a very different world than the world of the 18th century, northern, than of 18th century North America. But, you know, as just sort of generalized types of protests, you still see these um, pretty commonly. Uh, so in the context of the 1760s and 70s, Economic resistance was a tool used, uh, one that brought women into uh, a more prominent political uh, space, uh, both literally and figuratively. Uh, and the primary reason why economic resistance was used uh, was because of a series of acts passed in 1767, so two years after the Stamp Act, that were called the Townsend Programs. Uh, that's T-O-W-N-S-H-E-N-D. The H is silent, so you pronounce it Townsend. Uh, the Townsend Programs were an attempt to raise new taxes uh, on the British North American colonists. Uh, 
but rather than an internal tax like the Stamp Act, which was repealed because of protests, uh, the Townsend program was a, a return to the more traditional kind of taxation, external taxing, so tax on you know, imported goods, goods that the colonists bought from Great Britain. Uh, in order to protest these Townsend Acts, uh, because they had to do with import duties, uh, many colonists, including chapters of the so-called Daughters of Liberties, resorted to economic resistance in the form of non-importation movements. So N-O-N dash import, I-M-P-O-R-T, Asian, A-T-I, A-T, I-T, Iowa. There we go. Non-importation. So you can Google it. <laughs> Non-importation. Uh, what were these? These were agreements by local merchants. So similar to the Sons of Liberty. So this is all local. This is Boston and New York City. Uh, Westchester County. Suffolk County. Not the state or the colony of New York and not a united continental-wide protest. Uh, these were local, uh, in which merchants uh, agreed, they came together voluntarily, and they agreed, we're not going to purchase or sell any more British goods until they repeal the Townsend program. Uh, why did they? Why was there a uh, protest to the Townsend program? Following the same pattern that began after the Stamp Act earlier, two years before. We don't have actual representation, therefore we did not consent to this act, or in the case of the Townsend program, acts. Therefore, we believe they're illegitimate. So this pattern begins to emerge and it begins to repeat. Uh, this is where women become important as the daughters of liberty, however, because uh, in order to effectively uphold non-importation uh, agreements, uh, women have had to play vital roles, being <coughs> the primary purchaser, excuse me, <coughs> the primary purchaser of the goods that were taxed by the Townsend program. Uh, most of the, the goods that had the new higher taxes from the Townsend program on them uh, were household items. So that's where women had a, a much larger role to play as the primary purchasers of household items. Uh, so what did the Daughters of Liberty do? Uh, well, they, they, they went about their business a couple of different ways. Uh, but to generalize, one of the things, most important things that they did was that they worked to replace the goods that they were no longer purchasing, goods that they formerly had bought from the mother country, by making their replacements. So the best example of this is in cloths. What cloths were a part of this Townsend program? Again, higher taxes. Um, and textiles uh, for cloths uh, were uh, almost entirely imported from Great Britain in the 1760s and 70s. So what women began to do is to make their own to replace them. This was called home spun. Uh, they spun their own cloths at home, is where the term comes from. So what the Daughters of Liberty do is actually organize these days, day to several day long events called spinning bees, where the, where the people of a community would come together and make as much cloth as they could so that they could replace the cloth that they were no longer buying excuse me, from the mother country. Uh, the Daughters of Liberty also engaged in what today we would call surveillance of their neighbors. It sounds a little creepy, but they would actually uh, surveil their local communities, their neighborhoods, to make sure that families were not uh, purchasing goods that they had agreed not to purchase because of not importation. Uh, so these are just a couple of ways that women uh, pursued and uh, organized as the Daughters of Liberty pursued protest activities. <clears throat> and these three kinds of protests, again, official petitions, uh, popular protests, economic resistance, uh, existed at the same time, and they were often used as tools sort of simultaneous to each other so that there would be popular protests at the same time that a town like Boston was uh, uh, organizing a non-importation movement at the same time where Massachusetts legislators might be writing a petition to protest the Townsend program. Uh, 
So the point of that is to say that it's not helpful to think of these as existing independent of one another, that they, they existed simultaneous and they were used simultaneous. But it is interesting to think about, uh, and maybe this will uh, be a, a large part of our discussion board for this week, think about the relative strengths and weaknesses of each one, because I think each one has a strength and a weakness, or more than one strength and more than one weakness. So that's just a way to sort of that I would suggest thinking about, uh, in this case, the Townsend program. Okay, so now for my second topic of the day, loyalism. So I'm gonna talk for less time because we're gonna to return to this topic actually uh, in a week or two. Uh, so I don't wanna to spend too much time talking about it, but because so much of the discussion uh, of this time period, the 1760s and 70s, uh, revolves around protest, which would eventually become revolution, as we'll see. Uh, it's worth it just to remind ourselves of the basic fact that throughout the 1760s and 1770s, uh, the time period under discussion here, um, at no point can we say that uh, more than half of the protests in North America, pro, uh, 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 colonists in North America were openly protesters to the British Empire. Um, and uh, on average, we could say that about 25, maybe up to 30, depending on the colony, a percent of the population were in fact loyalists, meaning they remained openly loyal to the British Empire. <laughs> Now, as I talked about a few weeks ago, and some of you actually wrote this in um, your responses, I think, to the clips you picked from The Patriot, that Mel Gibson movie, the rest of the people sort of just sat in the middle and, 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 and in effect waited to see what would happen before they declared their loyalty uh, to the American protest movement or to the British Empire. So I, I just want to talk a little bit about it now and just to think about some of the reasons why somebody would have been a loyalist. Because... Uh, it will help us in part understand what comes during the war itself and it's something that we should just keep in our mind uh, in general as we move through the next couple of weeks uh, so there is a couple of different reasons why people were loyalists uh, first uh, and i think the easiest to understand in many ways is uh, the practical reason that people who had prospered in the North American colonies <clears throat> before the 1760s, people whose families had prospered and become wealthy uh, in over the course of the 17th and 18th centuries. Uh, when protests began to bubble up against the Stamp Act and later a uh, program like the Townsend program, uh, took the stance that while they might not appreciate the Stamp Act in particular, uh, that's not grounds for protesting uh, an empire which had, uh, all things considered, prospered, and therefore its colonists had prospered over the course of the 18th century, uh, especially if one came from a wealthy background or an elite background. Uh, people who came from elite backgrounds and wealthy backgrounds in North America uh, had practical reasons to remain loyal to the British Empire. The most practical of them is that they had prospered in the British Empire, so why should they protest it? Uh, this describes wealthy merchants, uh, especially living in uh, cities uh, along the Atlantic coast. Uh, this is really especially describes the merchant community of New York City, which had the highest population uh, percentage of loyalists, believe it or not, in um, the 1760s and 1770s. Uh, it also described folks not living in cities, but who were large landowners who had in general succeeded in, under the current structure of the British Empire. Uh, and while, yes, they may have taken the Stamp Act as an annoyance, were not willing to protest the British Empire. Um, the second group of people, just to talk about briefly, uh, who had very clear practical reasons for, in general, uh, casting their lot with the British Empire against 
uh, the American protesters were indigenous Americans. Uh, so many uh, indigenous Americans, and uh, it's fair to say that this probably describes about 70 to 75 percent of the tribes uh, of North America uh, ultimately would remain loyal to the British Empire uh, at the beginning of the American Revolution. Why? Because the British Empire, unlike North American colonists, had shown some interest in respecting their land claims in North America. The Proclamation of 1763, for example, which we've talked about, uh, which prevented North American colonists from moving westward into new British territories, uh, was one piece of evidence for Native Americans to say, well, it looks like while we don't love the British Empire, while we have, uh, that we don't entirely trust the British Empire, what we, the people that we really don't trust are the North American colonists who have shown time and again that they would like to move westward and violently displace us uh, if they possibly can. Uh, so that describes uh, the view of many indigenous Americans. Again, I'd say about 70% ultimately supported the British Empire against the American Revolution. A third group of people, just to think about it, again, we'll flush out these categories more in part because I don't want to go on too long here, uh, is uh, people of color, non-Indigenous Americans, but people of African descent in particular. Uh, because there, that's very interesting reasons for, for ultimately remaining loyal to the British Empire if they had the choice. Uh, so when we look at enslaved people, uh, most enslaved people, uh, if they had an opinion <laughs> on the imperial crisis that rooted in the 1760s and 1770s, we don't know what it was because it wasn't recorded. Um, we suspect, I mean, historians suspect that had they had the choice, uh, most enslaved people would have chosen uh, to rebel against their owners, slave owners, uh, many of whom, not all, but many of whom, especially in a large colony like Virginia, uh, ended up becoming patriots, supportive of the American cause. Uh, after 1772, what we find is that most people of color, whether or not they were free people of color or enslaved people, if they had the choice, uh, would have supported the British Empire because in 1772, uh, Perhaps one of the most famous court cases of the 18th century was decided uh, in, in London, uh, in, the, in the highest court of the British Empire. They called the Somerset case, which is S O M E R S E T, Somerset. Uh, Somerset case, uh, which, uh, without going into too much detail, and, and Alan Taylor writes about this case as well. So if you want more detail, you can pull up the index to that and, and discover the pages that he, he discusses this case. Uh, but this was a case that had to do with the status of a man who was held as a slave in Virginia, but then was brought to England, <clears throat> uh, where he claimed that he was free because he no longer was held in a colony where slavery was legal but had been brought to the mother country uh, where slavery had largely died out. This is one of the ironies, by the way, of slavery in this period is that in England itself, slavery had more or less died out, uh, was very insignificant. Whereas of course in the colonies, especially the Southern North American colonies and the Caribbean, slavery was a flourishing institution. So James Somerset uh, was the name of the man. That's why it's called the Somerset case. He argued that he should be freed uh, and he won his case, actually. Uh, the, the court, highest court of England, uh, Chief Justice Lord Mansfield, uh, handed out a decision in which he, he declared that in England itself, not the colonies, in England itself, slavery is illegal because English air is too free for a slave to breathe. It's a quote from, from the case. But he also said, slavery can remain legal in British American colonies. So it sort of solidified this uh, paradox where slavery would be legal in British colonies, but not in the British Isles itself. Now, why is this important for thinking about black loyalism? Well, uh, when this case was reported first 
when the first reports of it began to make their way back to North America, there was confusion about what the decision was. And most people in North America initially misunderstood it because of bad reporting and, and believed that the case actually said that slavery is illegal throughout the British Empire, including in the colonies. Now, this is all a long way of saying that when we start to explore the years of the war itself, this will help us understand the actions of enslaved people, especially in Virginia, uh, because uh, there was a widespread belief amongst the slave populations, especially in Virginia, which had the largest slave population in North America, uh, that the Somerset decision, which they found out about, uh, had freed them, but that the only thing that kept them in slavery was their slave owners. Uh, so there was a widespread belief that the King of England had made them free, but it was their slave owners who prevented them from gaining that freedom. So when the British Army began to mobilize in North America to put down the protest movements, the first thing that slaves began to do in 1775 was to run to the British Army to gain freedom. Uh, in November of 1775, the royal governor of Virginia, Lord Dunmore, formally offered freedom uh, to any enslaved person who would run away from their master who was a patriot to, to support uh, the British Empire in its uh, fight against uh, the North American protesters. Uh, and we can actually, we'll read Dunmore's proclamation as it's called uh, next week. Uh, so I'm gonna stop there for today. Uh, as I said, uh, I wanna really begin next Monday, our Zoom meeting with a lengthy discussion of common sense. So you've read sections one and three uh, already. Thank you. Uh, section four is the longest, and I'll just tell you right now, the kind of most complicated. Um, section four, don't worry about remembering every single detail, uh, because as you'll see when you read it, there's a bunch of math equations in it and a bunch of calculations that aren't necessarily important for us. It's more about the ideas but the most important section of this is section three, uh, the section called Thoughts on the Present State of American Affairs. So I'm going to pick up with that, um, and then I will see, and I'll see you all then. Uh, you'll, you'll receive an email from me today, Thursday, with further instructions about the deep discussion group, but um, I will sign off, and uh, thank you, and see you soon.